Welcome to the first NAR meetup here at Edmonds. I still see people who don't know me, so uh, my name is Silad, I'm the organizer of this meetup. And uh, I'd, like, I'd like to thank first uh, Edmunds for hosting us, and uh, Carlos will talk a little bit about Edmunds, and then we'll pick it up. So, uh, all I was going to say is that we have several job openings available, like some, some job descriptions uh, here on the calendar, uh, engineering, data analysis. If you're interested, feel free to see me afterwards. All right. And we have uh, today Eric introduce the speaker since uh, Eric and I, we are like trying to promote reproducible research for years uh, with, uh, I don't know, more or less success. So uh, here we go. Everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, so lately, recently, last decade, there's been a growing understanding of the value of understanding what's in your data. And so one way I think of that is, what is, what is the product, okay? Is it a bunch of tables and graphs? Uh, sort of, but another way of thinking of the product is all of the thought and uh, exploration that's encapsulated in what created the product. So one way you can produce that is interactively in some console, and that thought product is kind of gone when you're done. Another way is to use a script. So any scripting solution is probably preferable for almost any reasonably sized problem than just interactively hacking along. So you know, one of the first things you do in grad school, if you're not already there, or anytime you get twisted into Scripting. Okay, so that's progress. But actually, scripts quickly become unreal. Right? You've got a script, and it kind of does this, and it kind of does that, and then it takes too long to compute this, and you break it up, and the computing part, and then you have this part, and that part, and you've got to remember the order of things. Okay, so when you have interactive research, your, your research is impossible to reproduce. With scripts, it's only almost impossible. So we need something better. Um, and for a long time, s was kind of the default uh, option for this. You could, you could use s and it could put your stuff together, get your displays coming out of the same thing, and you could do computation, you could drag your thing. s was hard to learn. And once you learned it, in my case even, eh, sometimes it was just too much trouble. I'd just go back to like generic scripts. So, there we were in 2010. This, this problem is easy to, to describe in 2010, and everybody's kind of like, yeah. And even if you knew, this is a personal anecdote, when I got to grad school, I was involved leading in a huge project. And I didn't know what was going on yet, but I had heard about Make in my last job. I had heard of Make, and Make is good. And I thought, of course, they must be doing something like Make for this. <laughs> no. Because, no, that was just too hard to think of. So a long time went by, and somebody sitting over here put the pieces together for us. And um, so now we have uh, the possibility of efficiency both with regard to computation. You don't unnecessarily run your computations that are static and not changed. That helps you keep things together, to break up your scripts, where it's logical to break them up, not where CPU doing ad hoc forces um, That simplifies management of your process, uh, makes it more reproducible, um, and allows you to, to follow Donald Muth's dictum. He knows it. Spend your time explaining to other humans what you're getting the computer to do. Okay? And then everything just becomes very clear after that. If you're explaining that in your, in your comments, you and, and other people, but especially you, will know what young people like you were doing a year ago when you were doing something. Okay, so um, so again, not easy to describe in 2010, but we have uh, we have e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e e
Um, so he, let me just give a few things. Right? So he got his master's in stats at Redmond University, very prestigious university, I think it's very prestigious university to be. Um, very top university in Sumner. Um, he went to the University of Iowa. Well, Iowa State, sorry. Yep. <laughs> and uh, he worked with a very prestigious committee, uh, Diane Cook and Heidi Hoffman. Yep. Yes. Uh, whom names you might have been familiar with even before you know his name. Um, he initiated the first R conference in China. He's got a website he built for statistics training in China. It's very, very lucky to have him here today because he is practically a doctor in reproducible research documents. Wrote the book on it, and uh, thank you very much for coming. We're honored to have you. All right. Uh, do I need to take the mic? Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm going to get the mic. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. All right. Thanks, uh, Eric, for the very nice introduction. Uh, uh, I guess after your introduction, I don't have anything to do left. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it, uh, so in this talk, I'm going to uh, tell you something new about the development of Knitter and the R Markdown stuff. So, yeah, Eric just gave uh, an introduction about me. So here's my version. So I came from China. My first language is, unsurprisingly, Chinese. And my second language, I consider that to be R. I have been using R for quite a few years. And uh, my third language is English. So please forgive me if you hear any broken English or things like that. And I graduated from Iowa State. Last year, I joined our studio. I wrote and maintained a couple of R packages. Uh, and our conference in China and a uh, website. Now, that's pretty much all about me. So in this talk, uh, an important topic is uh, the concept of dynamic documents. So why do we need the dynamic documents? And I know that many of you are familiar with this process of uh, data analysis. You basically just click, 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 and copy and paste to you know, write a report. Right? You always press Control C and then press Control V. And that, that can be a problem. And uh, the reason for that is after you have finished a project, Imagine you hear these words, and that will be very misery, miserable. You, maybe your boss can ask you, please do that again. And there can be many, many reasons for, for that kind of a request. For example, oh, sorry, we, we made a mistake in the data source, or the second column of that data should be um, something else, or Okay, I, I don't want the I don't want this parameter to be uh, 0.5. I want to change it to be 0.1 and things like that. So, and your life will be like this. So whatever you did from the last week, you have to do that again this week. So you just click, 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 and copy and paste, and th that's that's certainly not efficient in terms of doing your data analysis or doing working on your projects. And we really hope to automate something that should have been automated. So here comes the basic idea of a dynamic document as compared to uh, a static report. So the dynamic document is basically a combination of some computing code with some narratives to describe what you are doing in this report. So for the code, you can, use, you can choose your favorite computing language, for example, R or C or Python. And for the narratives, normally you choose an authoring language, uh, for example, LaTeX or HTML or Markdown. And uh, here is a, a very uh, minimal uh, example. So for example, first we write a paragraph, we built a linear regression model, and then we wrote some code in this uh, code chunk. So for this part, we call this a code chunk. The code chunk starts from a chunk header. So this is actually an R Markdown document. An R Markdown document starts uh, with these uh, three backticks, and then curly braces, and then little r. That's called a chunk header. And later we will uh, tell you what, what we can do inside this chunk header. 
And then we write some R code, build a linear regression model. It's a very simple one. It's just, just uh, the distance against the speed using the data, data set cars in, in R. And we extract the coefficients and store that in uh, an object named B. So now B is a vector of length 2, and we draw some graphics or diag diagnostics uh, plots for, for that linear regression model. And then we continue writing our narratives. And the slope of this regression is uh, backtick R space B square bracket 1. So this B1 basically means there's this. Uh, the first, uh, uh, oops, I made a mistake. This should be this intercept, right? Uh, oh, you see, when you have this problem in, in practice, I, I didn't do that intentionally. When you have this problem in practice, if, if you hard code the number there, it will be very difficult to, for you to find out what's wrong over there, right? If you hard code the number there, like the slope of the regression is 2.5, and then maybe when, you, when your colleagues look at your report, then it will be hard to track the, the, where this error c came from. If you write a dynamic document like this, then if you get anything wrong, you can realize it immediately, like I did in this talk. Right? <laughs> I really didn't realize this mistake. <laughs> so you write some R code in this inline expression, and then when you compile this document, the code will be executed, and the results will be in the output. So everything is dynamic. dynamic. You don't hard code anything. So now imagine if your boss, maybe he, he doesn't like the intercept, okay, maybe can you remove the intercept from the linear model? So uh, you can say, uh, yeah, of course, uh, I just changed this formula to be uh, dist uh, tilde speed minus one, right? You know, that means to remove the intercept from the, the linear regression. And you just update that formula and compile this document again. And this, the slope will be automatically updated. So this is uh, an example of a dynamic document. So here is a, a longer version of a dynamic document. So this is still a markdown uh, document. So we have some code chunks, and hopefully you can see the code chunks uh, have some different uh, background color. It's a little bit gray there. And we have the chunk header, and we can have some chunk options. Like for this code chunk, I want to control the the output, for, for example, I want to control the size of the graphics. Then I say, okay, figure.height equals 5, figure.width equals 6. That means I want the plus from this chunk to be uh, 5 by 6 inches. So here you can set some uh, parameters in the beginning. For example, this is an example from uh, actually a homework assignment, which is about the uh, gene expression, so you scan some p-values from your uh, data file and set some parameters like alpha level equals uh, 0 0.05 and then you draw a bar plot and after you have this chunk ready, you can just click a button to compile this source document to uh, the output like this. So you can see the still see the source code in the, in, in the output so here we have the alpha level, we have the p-values, we can print the vector of p-values, we draw a bar plot of these p-values, we have 10 p-values over there, and then we annotate the alpha level by this red line, and we want to pick out the genes that should be identified as uh, differentially expressed. Uh, it doesn't matter if you don't know what that means, but the, the basic idea is that, uh, so everything is written in code, and uh, if you want to describe your methodology, like how do you want to adjust these p-values, and there are different types of methods, so if you know a little bit about statistics, you probably are familiar with the Baumfrontian's method, or the Holmes method, or the ben Benjaminian and Hodgeberg me method, so you can describe your method using some uh, LaTeX math here, so you can write your equations or uh, th things like that. And then you start writing your code to implement these methods. So as you know, everything is just in uh, one document. So you, you described the, the Bonferroni's method over there using the math language, and here you, you implement your method using the R language. 
so it. So you, you work with all these things in, in one single document. And uh, eventually you just uh, hit that button to compile this document. And now imagine if you, if you uh, found a mistake in the data source, for example, in this text file, you just correct that value in the text file and recompile this document. And if you, if you want to change uh, some parameters, like I want to raise the alpha level from 0 0.05 to 0 0.1, I just change that value and click the button, and everything will just be updated automatically. So this will be very fast to update your existing reports. So imagine if you have done that using the method of uh, copying and pasting, then uh, whenever you want to change a, a certain parameter, you have to copy the code and paste that into R and collect the results and copy the results and paste that into either LaTeX or Word. So that process will be very, very tedious. So now you maintain your report using just using the source code. And that's the basic idea of a dynamic document. And what happens behind the scenes uh, when I click that button in RStudio is that RStudio will uh, load the, this package called knitter, so which is an R package. So if you want to install it, you can use the function install.packages. And this knitter package supports a variety of uh, document formats. For example, the, if the file extension is .rnw, that normally means that document is a combination of R code and LaTeX code. If uh, the file extension is RMD, that means um, it's about R and Markdown. So, you know, R is the computing language and LaTeX and the Markdown are the authoring languages. And in theory, you can work with uh, any computing language and any authoring language in one document. So, I just showed you how R works. Actually, in Knitter, you can specify some other options like engine. I want the computing engine to be, let's say, Python. Okay, let's then let's start writing some Python code. Let's say hello world and then we print, uh, uh, we split this character string using space, uh, a space. And now when you click this button, Knitter will uh, use Python to execute this code chunk instead of the default R engine. So, you know, these uh, computing languages can live just in one single document. So if, even if you have like shell scripts or make file, you can do all, all of all these things just in one place. Mm. And there are some editors that support the Knitter package, for example, RStudio, which is not surprising. And uh, also you can play with uh, Lix, which is uh, like a front end of LaTeX. It has a visual uh, user interface, but uh, behind the scenes, it's still uh, LaTeX. And if you, are, uh, if you work with Emacs, you probably can consider the ESS package and the, there are uh, some other uh, editors that support Knitter. These editors are uh, documented in the Knitter website, and you can Google for that. So we have these many uh, document formats, but there's a problem, which is like the Olympic uh, slogan for the uh, for the Beijing 2008: "One world, one dream." That's that's not the reality, right? You know, the the, the it is always the one world with many dreams. So you use word, uh, you, you use LaTeX, I use Markdown, he use HTML, and things like that. And sometimes the situation is even worse, which is to some people one world just means one Microsoft Word. <laughs> and that would be, I mean, I don't mean that that, that is bad. I, I mean that that is just too bad. So. <laughs> You know, there are people working with LaTeX and they just like the backslashes, which I absolutely hate. And you know, when you want to write a section heading, you use the command backslash section, and you want to emphasize a word, you use the command backslash m. 
And uh, if you're in the world of HTML, then you use different uh, commands or tags. You know, we want to the first level section heading, you use the h1 tag. We want to write a paragraph, you use p. We want to emphasize a word, you use the tag em. But if you think, if you take a closer look at these markup languages, you, you will you may realize that okay, maybe we are just waste, wasting our time just learning all these kinds of markup languages because essentially what we want is just get that stupid content done. I don't care what uh, if I just use the backsla backslash section or the h1 tag. So we, we want to get the content done. Uh, but there are uh, two extremes in, the, in terms of the uh, authoring language and on one extreme it is LaTeX which has allows you to have precise control over uh, the output for example in the PDF but it has full complexity and it has horrible readability in at least in my eyes and on the other extreme it's Markdown and there's nothing special about Markdown it's just very very simple if you can't master markdown in like five minutes I, I will surely give you ten dollars <laughs> so on the left left uh, column you can see some uh, a, a sample uh, LaTeX document when you want to write a section you use backslash section and you uh, backslash env to emphasize a word when, when you want to write a, a numbered list then you use this weird begin numeric environment and for each list uh, for each item you use this backslash item that's just too much to to type right and by comparison when you write uh, writing markdown when you want the section heading you just use one hash or one pound to to start the first level section and you want to second level section heading you use two hashes you want to emphasize a word you just use uh, underscores. That's pretty much like how we write emails, right? So the syntax is very simple. When you want to, uh, a numbered list, you just use numbers instead of using the weird backslash item uh, command. And you know, in the LaTeX world, there's there are also many other um, rules that you can never remember. There are just exceptions, like when you want to write a literal dollar sign, you use backslash dollar, you want to write a literal ampersand, you use backslash ampersand. But when you want to write a backslash, you don't you write backslash backslash, instead you use backslash text backslash. And when you want to write tilde, it's not backslash tilde, it's not backslash text tilde, it's dollar backslash same dollar. It's just, you, you, can, you can never remember these kind of rules. But in, in Markdown, you don't you don't need to remember anything. There's nothing special about it. You want you, if you want to write a dollar sign, it's a dollar. If you want to write a backslash, it's a backslash. So we want to focus on the content, and because LaTeX is uh, such a complicated tool, it may make some people happy because occasionally you get some small challenges, and you are very happy solving these challenges until one day you get into trouble. And this is how I feel when I use Markdown. I can still play with the water, or the water holes, right? You can play over there, or oh, it's a little bit dark over there. Yeah, there's a water hole. And you can play, 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 and uh, just happily continue your journey. You will never be stuck in, in a certain <laughs> hole. So, and uh, for those who just want uh, precise control over their uh, document output, they may ask a question. Is Markdown just too simple? There, uh, everybody can learn that in five minutes. And the answer is probably yes. But the real question is not about whether Markdown is too simple or not. It is how much do you want? I mean, do you really want that uh, particular word to be in this complicated command like backslash text bf to make it bold font and then backslash sf to use sans serif font on that word probably not so if you if you are coming from the latex world and if you ask too much from markdown markdown might just bite you bite you very hard so 
eventually you have to give up something in if you if you want to live comfortably in in the world of markdown and uh, Mark, uh, you know latex is uh, origin uh, was originally invented actually for printing purposes i mean for like publications you want to print an article or a book on paper so that's that's where latex is very strong but you know there are other fancy things about HTML, and uh, you can take a look uh, at some examples. So this is a uh, uh, output from a, a, a vignette in the Nether package. It was produced from Markdown, but uh, apparently I Im embedded something else in this page. So for for this vignette, you can actually interact with it. So for example. Uh, if you just hate the code like your boss, I don't want to read the source code. Get get rid of that code. So you can just press a key to hide the code. Or if you are really smart, you know, I don't need your descriptions. I don't need the narratives. Just show me the the raw code. Uh, then you can just hide the, the descriptions and show you all the raw code. Or you can read them side by side and uh, see okay what I described here, what I did, what I really did here. Okay, so you can see how the, the computing goes on in, in this document. You can see text output or graphics output. So that's uh, one small example of how uh, what you can do with HTML or Markdown or JavaScript. And the other example is that so this is a project I saw just a few days ago. It is called the uh, Git Git Book. So you can go back and Google for that. The Git a book project uh, is also based on uh, Markdown, so you can write very nice HTML pages to to make a book. So you can easily navigate through these uh, chapters or sections, and you can read content of the the book. And at the end, you can interact with this book by doing some exercise. You can write your code to to uh, solve the problems that were given to you and submit to check if your uh, solutions are correct or not. So these kind, of, uh, these kind of interactions are certainly not possible or, or not easy with uh, LaTeX, right? So there's uh, really a lot to play with uh, Markdown and LaTeX. Oh, I'm sorry, Markdown and HTML. And uh, so talking about R Markdown, there has been some evolution. So originally, we have the first version of R Markdown, which is the Markdown package on CRAN. So the, uh, but after we did that, we, we were often, uh, oftentimes asked, uh, how can I convert Markdown to Word? You know, we often hear that kind of request. And uh, in the past, we used to do, we used to tell them, okay, you can go to a tool called Pandoc. So we, you know, we push the user a little bit to help them, but eventually we realized that probably that's, that's probably not a good solution. So later we just decided, oh, why not just go to Pandoc and solve the problem directly? We will produce a Word document for you. We will never shy away again. Uh, so. We will face the problem, we will build Pandoc into our studio, and we will solve the problem for you. If you want a Word document, we will give you a, a Word document. So this is uh, the, the, the main character in this uh, GIF is actually this guy is JJ, he's the CEO of our studio. He wrote the, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, he wrote the uh, R Markdown package, and I just, this is how I felt after I, so uh, his R Markdown package, and that that is really cool. <laughs> so for Markdown, many people will think ah, Markdown is just too simple, too naive. Uh, what can you do with Markdown? Uh, but uh, there, the Pandoc sees um, Markdown uh, differently. So when when everybody sees this, th this little guy is just too weak, too uh, you know, you you can't do anything. But Pandoc sees the shadow of the Jedi warrior. So what can we really do with Markdown? So the original version of Markdown looks like this. So it was invented primarily for HTML output. You can write paragraphs, you can write section headings, blog quotes, 
emphasis, lists, links, images, code blocks, and it's a very simple language. And uh, Pandoc extended uh, the original version of Markdown in many, many directions that uh, make it very appealing. And for example, you can uh, write tables in Markdown, you can have some LaTeX math that, that, that is especially attractive to stat statisticians or mathematicians. You can write LaTeX math here and your LaTeX will be rendered uh, using the, this library called MathJax. So you can see this is pretty much the quality of LaTeX output. Right? You can render math in, in the web pages and uh, you can have some metadata about your documents. So, for example, uh, originally you, you, you cannot write like the title or author or date about your document, but now you can uh, embed this kind of metadata in using uh, the YAML syntax, which I will introduce uh, to you later. And uh, whenever you feel you are just too weak, you can actually turn to the more uh, the, uh, turn to the stronger tools like the raw HTML or raw LaTeX. You can embed Markdown code inside some raw HTML code or raw LaTeX code. For example, if you if you have this command backslash m in the in your Markdown document, Pandoc will uh, preserve this this piece of uh, text when it compiles uh, it to uh, LaTeX. We need to convert Markdown to LaTeX. So this is a very cool because whenever, wh whatever you can, you cannot do with the, uh, whatever you cannot do with Markdown, you can just turn back to HTML or LaTeX. And also you can write uh, footnotes or citations, bibli bibliography, or things like that. So I guess this is this will be very appealing at least uh, to the academia people. And uh, so we can actually go from Markdown to many other document formats uh, for when, when we want the uh, output. For example, we can convert Markdown to LaTeX, to PDF, to Beamer slides, to HTML, or to HTML5 slides, including IO slides, or review.js. I will show examples for this kind of HTML5 slides later. And eventually, we have got a Word output, and uh, that's something some people really like, but personally, I, 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 I'm really not a big fan of Word. And you can convert Markdown to uh, ebooks, and the, so you can go back and uh, Google for Pandoc. It's a really powerful tool to do the conversion between uh, different document formats. So the ARM, so the second version of the ARM, ARM Markdown is uh, uh, in this. Our Markdown package is not on Chrome yet, but uh, it's still uh, under development on GitHub. So in the past, when we want to use Pandoc, this is what we normally uh, do. We just load the Knitter package and knit the R Markdown document to get a, a Markdown document, and then convert the Markdown document to other document formats like the PDF uh, output. So we, we, we have to open a command window to uh, type the command like pandoc to beamer uh, and from this input.md and uh, we want the output to be named as output.pdf. Uh, so in the past, the, we used to have uh, these two separate steps. And now we can do, do these two steps just in, in one function in the R Markdown package. And the reason, uh, actually the motivation for this R Markdown package is that we want to have some reasonable wrappers to produce a reasonably beautiful output by default. And uh, the problem with Pandoc and Knitter is that uh, both of these uh, two, uh, tools have just too many options. So for example, Pandoc has 73 command line arguments. You certainly do not want to memorize all of them. And Knitter has 49 chunk options. And we just wrapped up some uh, some of these options that can give you some uh, give you beautiful output. For example, for HTML output, we just don't 
uh, accept the default HTML output instead we embed the, the bootstrap themes in, in in this R markdown package so when you have HTML output the, 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 the HTML page should look reasonably good and we will uh, do syntax highlighting on your code using the library uh, called highlight.js and uh, I will show you examples in a moment and for installation you can uh, get the R Markdown package from this website called rmarkdown.rstudio.com. So currently, only the preview version of RStudio has support to this package because everything is still under development. So we will really appreciate it if you can test this uh, the preview version of RStudio and the, the, the R Markdown package on GitHub. And one thing to notice is that you don't have to install Pandoc separately because we have shipped uh, the Pandoc executable just inside RStudio. So everything will just work by default if you just install the preview version of RStudio. But uh, one, one principle of developing packages in RStudio is that we never want to we never want you to be stuck in the RStudio IDE. We want all of our packages, uh, we hope all of our packages can be used outside of our studio IDE. So here is the command line usage of the R Markdown package. So you, if you take a, a Markdown document input, you can call the render function in the R Markdown package to render this file to a certain type of uh, output format. For example, I, if I want uh, a PDF document, I can use the second argument PDF underscore document. I can use this function to tell R Markdown package that I want. I want you to convert R Markdown to Markdown and then Markdown to LaTeX and LaTeX to PDF. So that's what what happens behind the scenes. And if you want Word document, that's also okay. And by default, if you don't provide anything, render will just uh, generate uh, the HTML output. And besides these documents, you can also write uh, uh, slides or presentations using uh, the render function. For example, if you're in the academia, you are probably familiar with Beamer slides. And also, there are some cool HTML5 slides like the, uh, the IO slides. This is uh, what I use for this presentation. So what you see here is actually the IO slides. Mm -hmm, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yes. And the other thing, you made a little hint with the PNP version. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because for, for those who haven't been last year at GSAR, mm -hmm. basically there was a secret RStudio version <laughs> that if you Google for RStudio preview, you would get, but otherwise you would not. So mm -hmm. if you just go to the, the RStudio <coughs> web page, you would never get the uh, that's so, right. Uh, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. of course, you cannot tell us now. But, uh, <laughs> I guess we should do the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that it has, uh, it has uh, integrated uh, the R markdown inside and mm -hmm. just, you just have to do so much. Yep, but yep. I have a friend here who lured me into spending the last hour before I came here in trying to set up uh, Nika Bootstrap. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to a point that I needed to install Astro. To oh, that's right. And that's then, exactly. Uh, that's where, and then, then I had to leave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, uh, I told him that probably in two months, uh, our studio will have this all this package together. It will be uh, just push of a button. But it seems that it's not two months. <laughs> it's right yeah, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The current version does have the HTTP. It just doesn't have the latest that's right. The, the, yeah, the current official release does not have the support for the R Markdown package, but it, it does support Knitter. And if you just go to this link, rmarkdown.rstudio.com, you can get the links to all the uh, required tools, in, including the link to the preview version of RStudio. Yeah, Pandoc has a, has a giant uh, footprint. You have to install a lot of Haskell libraries. That's, that's really a habit. That's why we built Pandoc just inside our, our studio. Maybe there is something who might be confused because 
There is a package called Markdown mm -hmm. that's on Gram, mm -hmm. which is what it's used currently. For right. right. And then <coughs> this new package is called R Markdown. Right. So the, uh, the Markdown package is uh, the first version of R Markdown, and R Markdown is the second version of R Markdown. I know these are bad names. Hadley <laughs> <laughs> wasn't there. <laughs> no. His name is Markdown too. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how how we are going going to name the next version of R Markdown. <laughs> Mark, R Markdown version three. <laughs> yeah. So for R Markdown version 2, you can have some YAML metadata in your Markdown document. So for those who are not familiar with YAML, so basically you write some metadata uh, between these uh, three dashes. So the form of the metadata is basically a tag, uh, for example here, title, then colon, then value. So it's basically, basically tag value. And if you have some sub-elements for a certain tag, you can in indent uh, these elements by two spaces. So when you have an R Markdown document with the metadata like, like this, so the important, the most, most important field in this mark R Markdown document is this output tag. So when it has this output tag that has the value, for example, HTML, uh, HTML document, when you compile this R Markdown, R Markdown document in R Studio, what really happens behind the scenes is this. So R Studio will load the R Markdown package and call the render function to compile your input.rmd file and using the setup here. So you know, this is basically a translation of the metadata here. So HTML document is the function specified here, and the arguments TOC equals true, theme equals united are specified here. So TOC basically means the table of contents, and the theme is the uh, CSS theme for your <coughs> HTML output. So you can either uh, render the document using metadata, or you can use the command line interface. So if, if you have the metadata in your R Markdown document, uh, basically you can ignore the, the, uh, the argument here. So R Markdown will det detect these arguments in, inside, the, inside the document. So you might be wondering, what, what on earth is this HTML document? Uh, in fact, it's, it's nothing but a, a list of options. As I told you, we have a lot of available uh, options in, in either Knitter or Pandoc. So what we did is we used these kind of wrapper functions to wrap up some reasonably good default option options for either Knitter or Pandoc. So you don't have to memorize all, all these options. So just by default, it, it will work reasonably well. And uh, because you know the HTML document function returns a list, then actually your output format can be extensible if you are not satisfied with the default output. So you can write a function, for example, named my nice document, and then you can pass some, your, uh, some custom um, options to your function, and you can define your own output format if you want. So that's totally extensible. In our Studio IDE, you don't have to remember anything because when you want to create an R Markdown document, you can just do that from the menu. For example, here from File, New File, R Markdown. And then there's a wizard. So you, uh, you need to choose whether you want a, a document or you want presentation or you want to build that from some, some templates. So the templates can be useful when you, for example, when you want to write a, a journal paper, you can define your own R Markdown template with some, for example, if the, if the journal requires some LaTeX preamble, you can define this pre preamble in the template. So this is uh, slightly advanced for this talk and you can find more details in the 
website rmarkdown.rstudio.com. So for now, we will just uh, uh, show you the example of creating an R Markdown document. So you just specify the title field, uh, the author field, and then choose uh, what kind of default output format you want. So you don't actually don't have to decide at this moment because you can always change it uh, from uh, another button. So after you have uh, chosen these options, you just click OK, then it will give you a document like, like this. So as I said, the most important uh, field uh, or the most important tag here is the output. You can have multiple output output formats under this output tag. So, for example, you can have Word or PDF or HTML out, uh, output. And here is a little button that allows you to uh, set the options for this uh, different output format. For example, for HTML output, we want the theme to be like readable or we want to include table of contents so just notice when when I change the options here just uh, note what will change here so I click OK and then RStudio will automatically update the metadata over here so it will change it will add an option named TOC which takes the value yes that basically means I want the table of contents and uh, there are other options like I just changed the theme to be readable and you can you can, you can change the value here and the the, the wizard uh, the, the setting panel there will update uh, accordingly so these two places will uh, sync with each other uh, so after we are done so we can just click this button to see the output. So we have uh, an R Markdown document here. We have a couple of sections. So you can see single a single hash means the first level section heading and uh, can have some block quotes like using the right angle bracket to indicate this is a block quote. And you can have lists like using dashes or stars that's for the unordered list and you can write ordered lists or numbered lists using this one two three or one 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 so the, it doesn't matter which number you use here just to be sure it's a it's a numeric value then after that is a dot and some R code and uh, graphics and uh, math and you have the regression equation here and have some other extensions like you can write tables in uh, in Markdown. You can have some footnotes. And uh, let me show you the syntax over here. Yeah, so we have tables here. So it's basically that the text repre representation of a table. Then in the output, you will see the HTML table. For the footnote, you use the uh, caret inside the square brackets to write the footnotes. And uh, if you are from academia, you can have some citations using square brackets, then add your citation key. So that's basically, uh, you can, Pandoc will get the citations from your uh, bibli bibli bibliography file, like something dot bib. So you, you will have some references in your document. So that's how Pandoc uh, ex extended uh, Markdown. And uh, let's change the options a little bit and see what happens. So for example, let's change the theme from readable to united. And then you will see, OK, the color has changed, the, the font things have changed so you can tweak these options to get your favorite output so that's for the HTML output you can also have PDF output from the same document you can click the button <coughs> knit HTML 
and then uh, pandoc will convert markdown to latex and then latex will be compiled to pdf so now you can have a nice pdf document you see same document different types of output and uh, finally your favorite document format word let's knit this document to word and then we've got a word document you can see this is something pandoc dot docx which is basically means this is a word document yeah. there's one thing i can never understand the word document looks so bad and why so many people just like like using it so it's so much worse than the pdf output right do you guys agree no <laughs> yeah so yeah if you want the word document output you you can you certainly can do that i mean nobody can stop you from generating a word document so that's uh the three document output formats from R Markdown, and you can, as I said, you can write slides uh, using R Markdown. So first one is I/O slides, which is what I'm showing you here. So this is how the I/O slides look like. You can you use two hashes to start a new slide, and then you write the content. So it's basically the same as the uh, do the document tables, footnotes, citations, and then we have review.js, that's another type of HTML5 slides. Uh, just rotates again and again until the audience falls asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you have the review.js, and uh, lastly, our favorite Beamer slides, and I, I will always fall asleep when I see Beamer slides because it's so so popular in the academia. So everybody uses the, the Beamer slides. And you know, when you go to the uh, statistics meetings, you just see endless Beamer slides, which is very terrible. So anyway, as I said, you, you still can do it. Nobody can stop you from doing that. So um, multiple document outputs from a single file. And actually, if you are really lazy, you can, you can produce a, uh, oops, probably it's not here. You can produce a, a report just directly from, from an R script. When you have an R script open, there's a little button over there. You can just compile this R script to to a report. So as the time is running up, I'm going to skip that. And uh, yeah, I've shown you the demo and a little bit about the new uh, developments in the Nitter package. So one important new feature is uh, the chunk option called render. So this render option takes a function as its value and by default this render option takes the function net underscore print which is an S3 gener generic function in Knitter. So this is not on CRAN yet but you can test the development development version on CRAN uh, on GitHub. So what this option does is that um, you can customize how you how, how, how you want your objects to be printed. For example, uh, you know, in the past, a common, uh, a common request uh, to Knitter is that, uh, how, how can I print the matrices or data frames as tables instead of the text re representation in the, in the R console? That's a reasonable uh, request. And uh, now we have this new option called render, then then we can actually extend this S3 uh, generic function using your custom classes. For example, you can define uh, an S3 method called knit underscore print dot data dot frame. So if, if, 
if neither sees that S3 method, it will render the object, for example, your data frames uh, using that custom method. And I will just quickly show you an example. So whenever you have a data frame, data frame output um, in your R code chunk, you can define this method like this. So this method takes uh, an argument x, which is the object in that R code chunk, takes that object and convert that object to a table. So the table function is uh, is a function in order to produce uh, tables. You convert this data frame to a table. So now the result is actually a character string. And then I will use a special markup function called as is underscore output. Whenever I wrap up this character string in this function, and then Nira will know, okay, you have used a custom printing method, then I, I will just write your raw output in the in the in the document. And that might be a little bit difficult to understand, but here is an example. So we define <laughs> this S3 method here in this code chunk, and we will see what happens when we print uh, this data frame object called empty cars. So I guess most of you must be familiar with this data object. So if you do that in R, you will just see the text represent representation of this data frame, right? So after I have this, uh, defined this S3 method, then I compile this document, you will actually see the HTML table in the in the output, right? So you, you don't need to do anything. It seems you didn't do anything on the empty cars object, right? So in the past, you have to do like table or X table or things like that. Now the things will just happen by default if you if you have that S3 method available. So you can compare this output, this piece of output with the output here. So you can see these are just the normal text printing output in the in your R console. So this single change has a, a, a great impact in the development of Knitter. And one thing that we can do now is we can actually print shiny objects or ggvs objects inside an r markdown document so for just for those who are not familiar with shiny yet shiny is an r package for interactive web applications and here is a very quick example so for shine for a shiny app normally we have two r scripts one is called ui.r which defines the uh, user interface and one is called server.r which defines how you want to how you want to interact with the, your input values. For example, here I have a slider in the UI, so which was created using the function slider input in the Shiny package. I have a slider here. I can change the value of this, this slider, and the, the plot on the right column can be updated automatically. And the reason that this happens is that for this input element, I will collect a plot in the uh, 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 on the right panel, and whenever I change the input value here, denoted by this object input dollar bins. So you know bins is from here. So this is I, the ID of the input element. So I will collect th its value in this input object, and this will be a number. For example, it's 15, and then 15 plus 1 is 16. What I do here is I take the second column of the faithful data set, which is a numeric vector. I cut it into some intervals using this many number of bins. So, for example, I use 16 bins to cut this numeric vector and then draw a histogram using these uh, intervals. So that's what uh, basically what happens when I, when I run this application. So, I change its value, the plot can be uh, reactive. So we have talked about the uh, 
markdown documents, but one thing that it cannot do is that once you compile this document, you can no longer interact with your output. So this is this just uh, has become static. So you can only read the results in this particular report. But now we have integrated the shiny objects in, into R Markdown through the, the custom printing method that I mentioned. So now we have this R Markdown document with the, uh, a tag named runtime specified. So the value of runtime is shiny. So whenever R Markdown sees this tag, it will uh, first knit this document and then, then uh, launch Shiny to run this document. So let me click this button to compile this R Markdown document. So you see, this is just a normal, a normal R code chunk. You just see some static output here. And then I have a code chunk here, which, which is basically a numeric input. And you can see the output here. This is a numeric in input, which means we can input a number in this text box. So the numeric input function is, uh, is in the Shiny package. Similarly, the render table function is also in the Shiny package. So we have a numeric input here. We have an output uh, fragment here. So now we can change the value of this numeric input and now you can see the output will uh, respond to the changes you made here. Right. So now, now this dynamic document will become actually interactive. So that means this is no longer a single report. You can, you can write your custom input widgets in this report and allow your readers to interact with your documents. So this can be... so. This, this interactive report is like worth a thousand static reports right? because you can change, uh, change the input parameters and see how, it, uh, how the output um, responds to your, to your changes. So these are the single input widgets and you can actually embed a whole Shiny app in, in, in the R Markdown document. And that was done through the iframe tag if you are familiar with HTML, you probably know what iframe means. So if you have a, a, a separate Shiny app, you can just use the Shiny app function, which is in the development version of Shiny. And you can embed this standalone app in your report. And uh, if you have an app somewhere else, for example, if you have this app and in, in the Shiny package, you can just provide a directory. So you using the Shiny app dir function, provide a directory, and then R Markdown will run that app in your report. So this is another standalone uh, app. So just for those who are curious about the uh, technical details, so for all these functions like the Shiny app dir or Shiny app, what really happens is that when Knitter needs this document, the, these functions will return some objects of special classes, like uh, classes of Shiny app or things like that. Then we, we define a custom method uh, for the knit print function. And then the knit print function will collect the pieces of the, the, the Shiny widgets and write the HTML in the output. And that's how it was implemented. So now hopefully you can see just everything is coming together in one place and uh, we hope that we hope that can be very useful to you and we, we fully understand that data analysis is not a, an easy job. You probably have uh, gone through some hard work of research, you collected some complicated data and cleaned up them and you did analysis and we just hope the last step of statistical reporting can be much easier. So hopefully this will uh, describe what I feel about our work. So you, have, <laughs> you have done the hard work and we just hope the last step can be much easier for you. Okay.
Okay, I guess I'm done. So because the work is still under development, so just don't believe me blindly. Just go go back and try it out, and probably you will. <laughs> I might be like that that guy asking you to jump into the pool, and <laughs> who knows what will happen. So just try it yourself. And uh, thank you. Yeah, it's an intermediate file, but it will be removed. Uh, you can preserve that. Can you preserve it? Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, that's typically, I mean, since if I were going to use it for publishing a paper, I've got to send the tech document. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So as long as that tech document is out there, we can remove it. Yeah. It makes me think why we were calling the other one dynamic. This is dynamic. <laughs> but, uh, well. So this is freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I have one question. So for the dynamic, 2.0 part. Mm -hmm. uh, this is running probably shiny on. So let's say you do that on your laptop. It's running shiny on your laptop, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you can deploy this so that I. I the way I, I so I use a lot of ether, mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, very nice that you compile and the HTML contains everything. Mm -hmm. it contains uh, the PNG files. It's everything one document, so you can mm -hmm. just email it to your boss. Yeah. So about the, um, I don't know how would this work uh, if you want to email this to your boss. Uh, you certainly cannot email an interactive report to your boss, but uh, you you can you can certainly deploy that interactive uh, document on your server, and uh, that's actually on our on our plan for the uh, shinyapps.io. I'm not sure any of you have ever used this, so. This is a platform that we, we, we hope you can publish your Shiny apps. So at the moment, it only accepts the traditional Shiny apps, like the ui.r server type of Shiny apps. But in, in, the, in the near future, we, we, we surely will accept the uh, R Markdown documents as Shiny apps. This is basically a hosted uh, Shiny server. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you want to run it on your own, Mm -hmm. because you already have mm -hmm. it, that might be a feature. Right, right, yeah. So for Shiny Server, we have uh, we have the free version of the Shiny Server. We also have the professional version of the Shiny Server. It depends on what you want. You probably probably the free version will just works okay for you. So you can go back and see. Yes, that, that's the other thing we are trying. So Nitar, we are trying to have people, we are telling people to use Nitar for mm -hmm. like, I started two years ago probably. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Shiny is something that I and Eric and a few others are uh, using and uh, also we'll have probably a meetup about Shiny uh, later on this year for someone from our studio. Yeah. So Shiny is developed by Yep. How many shops yeah. Uh, yeah, all of the almost all all of the R Studio um, R Studio developers will come to the USR this year. Yeah. So hopefully, um, I will see you again in June. <laughs> how many are using Nitar? And uh, how many are not using Nitar? But after the stuff, they will start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will turn around. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's great. It's uh, okay. actually everybody else. Oh, okay. <laughs> How many of you are using Shine? Okay. So, yeah, we'll have uh, probably someone uh, in Paul. Uh, yeah, I, I would try to, to use Shine, but it's a little bit hard to get started. So, if you have to do browser, you can do half. That would be good. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, Erica and uh, Adrian. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question which is for me. I was kind of looking at the dynamic document. Mm -hmm. What if these are becoming like part of contact documents? Let's say that specifies for the sake of illustration, like 
Mm-hmm. Well, you can use version control and yep. commit, and yep. then uh, you have all the versions. And then you can look it up to change it at what time. Actually, uh, ironically, you end up somewhat back to interactive data analysis situations mm-hmm. because everybody can then start playing with the slider and the button and all mm-hmm. that. Every week, actually, I'm on a call, mm-hmm. and we're sitting around trying to figure stuff out, and, and uh, it would be nice to be able to push a configuration to someone else on the call. Mm-hmm. Hey, I found this, and have a look and see if you agree, and we should go up or down, whatever. Yep. Anyway, so that's, um, this, you know, you end up not able to communicate mm-hmm. configurations of interactive devices. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very, very good point, and that's something we really want to work on. That's Internally, that's what we call the bookmarkable state. We want, we want to preserve a state of the interactive report. Is it possible to add something that removes the document? At the moment, it's not supported yet, but we, we certainly will get there. Yeah, whenever I talk to my super smart friends, uh, we figure out that this is what we want, and then I tell someone from our studio, and they say that they are already working on it. <laughs> or, or they already thought that. But the Dynamic 1.0 is not that bad. So, I know, ironically, I think that Dynamic 2.0 is you lose a little bit of reproducibility right now, right? Because like you, you give the user the power to right, right. change so, the parameter. So I see that, and I see that the shiny dots, and I think to myself, it'd be nice to overlay some sort of collaboration feature, which mm-hmm. is basically, I think, what everybody's getting to. It'd be nice mm-hmm. to make it so that the state was shareable between collaborators. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. be like, yeah, just link it here, and just, I mean, there's there's real-time collaboration for mm-hmm. RTS, stuff like that. that yeah. You could just go connect, and all of a sudden, you guys are basically sharing the same the same exact state. There's mm-hmm. an entire collaboration layer and saves uh, steps of collaboration, like actually making a mistake and going back, and then making a mistake and actually saving all those steps. I think that there's a lot to that you do for the actual reproducibility of <coughs> social negotiation in the yep. search. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, we will. Uh, I guess, of course, we we have to release these things before the USA conference. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. By the way, uh, let me make a quick plug to user conference. How many of you know? How many of you don't know what user conference? Is? Okay, this is good. <laughs> how many of you are thinking about coming? Yeah, so uh, registration, I think early registration ends this week. So, uh, uh, Amelia, we, so I'm one of the co organizer. Amelia, do you, do you want to say any other words or if you think it's important? I think early registration. Yeah, um, someone was asking me earlier the first day is going to be tutorials. We have like six tutorials from our studio. And then the second two days are talks that you don't mention it because I haven't, but um, we're working on it. People are interested in a lot more than that. Yeah, so tutorials uh, this year it will be free, it will be no extra charge. And uh, I attended the last five years the conference, and tutorials are always uh, one of the best. So, uh, yeah, you will have a tutorial. Yep. Yeah. The, the only problem with tutorials is that the way we like 
five or six in the uh, morning, five or six in the afternoon, and obviously it can be only one each. So <laughs> it's going to be hard to, to choose. Yes? I was ready to register for the conference, but I want to know because there are so many things that look very interesting. So if any chance for the conference itself is going to be on video. So you can yeah, we'll, we'll save the main session and we hire one guy, so we'll save one session, uh, or the main plenary session, and when it's breakdown session, we'll take one of them. The tutorial? Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, I, we never thought of that, but maybe I'm nearly able to make another. All right, so let's thank you again. We might still have some pizza. I guess we still can hang around for like another 15, 20 minutes. All right, then let's thank again uh, Edmund for hosting and for being here.